Hello, everybody, and thank you again for coming to the final talk on the final day of PyCon 2017. We're so glad you made it this far. It's going to be a very interesting talk. We've got Gothic Colors, Using Python to Understand Color in 19th Century Literature, and we have Eleanor Stribling and Caroline, Caroline Winter speaking for us. May I please ask you to quiet your electronics? This is the last talk of the day, so anybody caught snoring? We're going to, no, I'm just kidding. Please welcome Eleanor and Caroline. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having us today. Thanks for coming. Um, and we hope this will be an interesting talk. So this is an example of a time where we use Python to solve a problem outside of programming, outside of tech, um, you know, not for building Twitter for cats or anything like that, but for um, a problem, a question that uh, Caroline had as a digital humanities scholar. And about a year ago, um, she mentioned to me, uh, she studies the Gothic period of literature, which we'll talk about a little bit more, the terminology, but uh, basically uh, literature, uh, mostly European, from from about 1700 through 1914 um, that follows a certain aesthetic, which again we'll talk about later. But she was curious um, about color mentions in that literature. And so I spent an afternoon, I thought of every color word I could. Um, I used Python um, to go through the text and count the color words and gave her a very preliminary readout of I think it was uh, Tess of the Dobervilles or something like that. Um, so we did that, but then um, a few months later um, she still had that question and so we thought we would do something a bit more in depth, and that's the project we're going to tell you about today. So first of all, let's introduce ourselves. So my name is Eleanor Stribling. Um, I live in San Francisco, California. I've been in tech since 2008. Um, I've mostly been in uh, client success and product management roles, um, but being in product management got me really interested in programming. So I've also been programming for about four years um, and get to do it sometimes at work too. So I'm one of those people who does not want to choose um, one thing over the other. Um, and I love Python, um, and I've been working in Python for about three years now. Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline. Um, so I'm a PhD student at the University of Victoria up north in um, Victoria, British Columbia, and I study British Romantic literature. So as Eleanor was mentioning, my time period is kind of late 18th century to early 19th, so I study um, novels like Frankenstein, for example. That's my time period. Um, and I'm what we call a digital humanist, which just means that I use computers to do my humanities research. Okay. Okay, so first we're going to talk a little bit more about how our project came about. So I'm going to explain a little bit more this problem that led to us starting on this project. So I'm going to start by showing you this painting. It's a painting by Claude Lorraine, and it's called The Enchanted Castle. It's showing up a little bit dark on the slide, but there's a castle in the middle and there's a figure in the foreground, and it's a very kind of dark, moody painting. Now this painting um, was really inspirational to one of the most well-known writers of the Gothic period uh, named Anne Radcliffe. And you may have heard of her novel, The Mysteries of Udolpho. It's kind of an iconic Gothic novel. So we know that she was really inspired by paintings like this, um, but the question I had was whether or not we can see this inspiration in her novels. So the question I brought to Eleanor was, okay, if we know that this is what the paintings look like and she was inspired by them, does she use these color words in her novels? If we could visualize her novels, would they look like this painting? And this question led to a broader question. What is the color palette of the Gothic? Um, so you might think of Gothic novels as you know, having haunted castles and damsels in distress and things like that, which is true. Um, and here I'm showing you another painting. This is by John Henry Fuseli. It's called The Nightmare. And you may have seen this before. It's an iconic Gothic painting. Um, it was very influential in the visual arts as well as in literature. And so we're wondering, um, OK, so if this is an iconic Gothic painting, does Gothic as a whole actually look like this? So if we, if we can visualize Gothic as you know, these dark colors in this painting, which again, unfortunately, you can't see that well in the slide, um, but it's full of dark shadows. So the, the background is all shadowy and dark. There's some really dark red curtains, kind of crimsony colors. Um, there's some kind of monstrous figures there. And then it's in really strong contrast to the figure in the foreground, who's the, the light-colored um, woman wearing a white dress. So what's important about this painting is partly this coloration, so this contrast between this kind of dark, shadowy world and this uh, light-colored figure in the foreground. So again, our kind of broader question was like, okay, so if this is an icon of Gothic visual arts, again, does this palette translate to the, to the literature of the time too? So does this kind of accurately reflect the color palette of Gothic literature as a whole? 
So I'm just going to take a slight detour and talk a bit more about the digital humanities. Um, so our project belongs to a field of study called the digital humanities, basically because we're using computers to do humanities research. In this case, we're studying, um, we're doing literary studies, um, but digital humanities involves things like history, art history, um, anything in the, in the realm of humanities. Um, it's a relatively new field of scholarly study, which is really exciting for humanists like me because it provides us with new ways of doing our research. So new tools, new methodologies, and new theory as well. So here I'm showing just some examples of different types of DH projects. Um, we do things like digitizing medieval manuscripts so we can have a digital archive of these rare and fragile materials. Um, on the top left there, <laughs> um, it's showing um, a network visualization of relationships between authors in the modernist period. And on the bottom there, it's showing um, we can uh, analyze text using statistics to see what genre things belong to. So there are lots of different ways you can, you can apply digital tools to the humanities. Um, and what's exciting about this too is that not only do we use computers to do humanities research, but we also study the digital um, as a product of, of humans, as something we make and do as well. So the purpose of our humanities, our DH project, um, as we said, was to discover the color palette of 19th century British literature. Um, so we know that literary scholars, we've studied Radcliffe's landscape description, so we've done kind of literary analysis about them, but nobody's actually explored her use of color specifically. Um, or, in fact, the color of 19th century Gothic fiction in a broader sense. So we found that nobody has answered these questions that I came to Eleanor with, partly because no one has even asked them before. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about the methodology um, that we used. So the first thing, we needed some kind of raw materials for this analysis. Um, so the first thing we needed was period color words. So like I mentioned, in the original version of this product, it was project, it was just me thinking about color words that I knew, and I figured like Damask was in there or something, like something that sounded old-timey. Um, so, but we actually went to the Oxford English Dictionary, um, and we got a list of color words um, that were categorized by family, but also by year. So we were able to take out things um, from post-1914, for example example, which do not fit into the Gothic period, so we didn't get sort of false positives on that. Um, and we also, we retained the older stuff just because in the literature it tends to, tends to throw back a little bit in terms of language. It uses some sort of more arcane language, so it was appropriate to leave the older words in. Um, and then representative text. So Caroline did a ton of work uh, putting together a pretty dynamite um, corpus for us of, um, we analyzed in this one 124 texts, um, most of which came from Project Gutenberg. Um, and then what we did what, with the Python was um, we wanted to analyze this corpus and sort of see where, where the two matched, where we could find color words in the Gothic literature. Um, so uh, we would find the name colors, we had to determine the type of word, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, the frequency and the order, because we wanted to see sort of the evolution of color through the text and see if there are any patterns, um, and of course visualize the results. But the other thing we wanted to do is put it all online. So um, that was another requirement for the project. So it wasn't just like churning through all the data, we wanted to actually put something on the internet. So I wanted to talk about some of the problems that we encountered um, because it, it was, I think, not, not super hard, but there were definitely things that we encountered that we didn't really expect at the beginning. Um, this is one of the problems we, we managed to anticipate early, um, and it's a thorny one. <laughs> um, <laughs> just checking if you're awake. Um, so it was about, uh, for example, the word rose. So English is a very weird language, um, and a rose can mean this. A rose is a noun, um, which if you need a uh, excuse me, grammar refresher, which I clearly did, um, is something that action happens to. So it's the subject of a sentence. Um, the rose is beautiful. Um, he gave her a rose, et cetera. So it's a noun. Rose is also a color. So this is what seemed the most sort of germane to our analysis, right? Um, rose is sort of a pinkish shade. It could be any one of these. So that, that seems to fit. But unfortunately, words like rose, and rose in particular, is interesting because it's also a verb. Um, it's the past tense of a verb. She, she rose to the occasion. He rose to meet me, et cetera. So we clearly just couldn't count the words. Um, so that's where it became more clear that we needed to use Python, and uh, in particular, the Natural Language Processing Toolkit, to categorize the words. Um, and when we first started, um, I said, yo-ho, this is great. Um, we will just look at adjectives um, and leave it at that. But um, as the project uh, evolved, after I did the first data run, um, we realized there was a problem with that. Yeah, we quickly realized that when we're just using adjectives, we weren't actually capturing all the words that were describing color. Thank you. Uh, so the first example at the top of the slide there, it's a passage from Frankenstein. And it's 
Pink is clearly used in this example to describe the color of the cheek. But because the NLTK uh, was picking this up as a noun, it wasn't being included in our list of adjectives, even though it was one of the words we wanted to study. Um, so we decided to capture color words um, that were nouns that were still being used descriptively. So the second example here is from Wuthering Heights. Um, it's describing an orange. Now in this case, it's actually referring to the fruit. So I took an orange from my pocket. It's referring to the physical thing. Um, but an orange is a really good example of this. But when things are so highly associated with their color, even when we're referring to the noun, it's still evoking that color. So you can't really separate the idea of an orange from the color it represents. So because of this, we, we thought, OK, we'll include nouns as well. It's actually enriching our data set, um, even though we're actually looking for descriptive words. However, this created a new problem, which we quickly realized, was that some of these nouns, even though they're color words, they're not being used to describe color. So here are just a few examples. Um, the first one is Isabella. Um, not something we, we use a lot today, but uh, in the Romantic period, it was a, quite a common color word, referring to kind of a light khaki color. Um, but in our text corpus, it's only ever used as a name. They don't actually use it to refer to the color. So we had to take it out. Um, similarly with natural, we, we still use natural as the term for kind of an off-white color. But in our corpus, it was only ever used as um, to contrast with unnatural. So it's used in a different sense. Same with imperial. We know this as a color of purple, but in our corpus, they only ever used it to talk about imperial courts. Um, and angry can refer to a color of red, but that's not how it was being used in our text corpus either. So we had to go through and, um, and look for these words that weren't, that weren't being used the way, we, the way we wanted to study them. They weren't actually being used to refer to color. And so this really highlighted when you're doing this type of analysis that you need to be familiar with the text corpus. So even though it's kind of a distant reading project, you still need to go back and check your results just to make sure you're capturing the words as they're actually being used. Yes, and I was clearly not familiar with the, the text corpus, so uh, <laughs> that's why I'm talking about the Python part of this. So um, I wanted to tell you more about what we did. So as I mentioned, one of our goals, we wanted to visualize it, and we, but we also wanted to put it on the internet. Um, so uh, we had to use a bunch of different tools to make that happen. I'm going to explain a little bit more about you know, what we did. Um, so we used the Natural Language Processing Toolkit. We've already mentioned that, which is a great uh, Python library for uh, text processing. recommend you check it out if you have not already. Um, we had a lot of, of data to go through. Through. So we had, um, like I mentioned, 124 texts. That included about 9.6 million words total. Um, and we had, um, from the Oxford English Dictionary, we had um, 1,142 color words. Um, so there's quite a lot to sort of sort through when you're doing this analysis. Um, so I wanted to pre-process um, some of it before we put it online. But then there was another kind of issue, um, which was that we also needed to think about how we were going to display this. As I mentioned, we wanted to visualize it. So what I did was um, the Oxford English Dictionary um, categorizes every single word into a color grouping. So what I did was I took the color grouping, um, and I looked at the uh, table that you can see there of web colors, and I related them to one another. So you know something in the deep red and crimson family family would get the crimson web color, et cetera. Um, admittedly, it is a little subjective, but I think I got pretty close. Um, we'll, we'll take feedback on that, but anyway. Uh, and then what we did was uh, put this data about the colors and their relationship, like the name of the color, um, the year uh, that it was first used, with, uh, and um, the hex value. We put that into Postgres. And then we also uh, put data from the text into Postgres as well, which I'm going to explain to you a little bit uh, right now. So like I mentioned, we start Project Gutenberg, NLTK, stuff in Postgres. So what did we actually do in that middle step with NLTK? So the first thing I did was tokenize the text, um, and that included removing punctuation, putting everything lowercase, um, et cetera. So and that's basically, if you're not familiar, it's basically splitting the text. Um, and then I used NLTK, like we mentioned earlier, to categorize it. So if it was an adjective or a noun, it sort of made it to the next stage. And here's some of the code that I used to uh, figure out if it was an adjective or a noun. Um, so at this point, you know, I'm, I'm going through the whole text um, you know, as, it, as it existed um, in its sort of original form. And um, then if it was an adjective or a noun, I used NLTK to lemmatize it. So lemmatization um, is basically a really in-depth form of stemming. So stemming is basically if you've got white and whiter, um, it will recognize that whiter is a form of white and say, OK, they're the same word, same root word. Um, I found that in, when we were going through this list, even though the word color list from OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, was massive, like over 1,100 words, we were still missing things um, when we used the stemmer 
um, that, were, that were sort of getting past that filter um, and weren't being converted correctly. And I think one of the learnings I had was that you know, language from this era was a little bit fluid and they, they did some funky things with words um, that I was not expecting. So the lemma excuse me, the lemmatizer, even though it's a more expensive process, was a lot better at, at getting the words and really finding the root words um, so that I can compare them to the color list. So if they were on our color list, um, so this is again the, the Oxford English Dictionary list, um, I would put them into a list that held both the original color word and the type of word it was, so whether it was an adjective or a noun. Um, and I did that little amount of data because, because these texts are so long, otherwise I, um, I'm using Django's web framework to put this online, I was, um, I was I was going past the character limit for the JSON field. So that was kind of a problem. So that's why um, that was what I, I stored in uh, as one part of, um, of our record. And then I made um, another record for a dictionary. So I basically just take every single color word in its original form um, and sum the number of times that we saw it. And um, you'll see in a moment what I did with that um, when we actually put it online. And then if it wasn't an adjective or noun, of course, I tossed it. Um, and then, so from Postgres, we had all this data from the text, like I mentioned, the dictionary, the list. We also had all the color data. So um, using uh, that data of Postgres, um, in the, the web app that you'll see in a moment, um, what went to the browser was data about um, basically how those, those two connected, like where the color words matched with a web color. Um, and what we generated was what we call a color profile. So it's basically each one of those little boxes represents an instance of a color word being mentioned. Um, and you know, colored, of course, with the, the web color that we identified to go with it. Uh, then the dictionary is displayed like this, so it's literally just the, uh, the color word that occurred and the number of times it happened, so just to give kind of a, the user a different view um, of the use of color, sort of what the most popular words are, really. Um, and then finally, uh, a radial chart um, that could summarize data uh, by a lot of different ways. We cut it a lot of different ways. You'll see some of them in the presentation. Um, on the website, we do it by author, but we also looked at it by, by period as well. So one of the first findings uh, we had was that there was a very wide variation uh, between the texts, which is not necessarily something we were expecting. So here you can see the two color profiles for two different novels, uh, the picture of Dorian Gray and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So you can see, and these are about the same length, approximately the same length. So you can see in the picture of Dorian Gray, there's, there's a much wider variety of colors being used. This, the palette being used is much richer than in Frankenstein. You can also see that there's, there's a different look and feel to the two different palettes. So Dorian Gray has just a wider variety of color, it's a little bit brighter, whereas Frankenstein is actually very green, which was, again, not something we were necessarily expecting. We can also use this data to compare the colors in different literary periods. Um, so this graph is showing um, all the color words in our romantic texts, and again, that's kind of late 18th century, early 19th. Um, and as you can see, it's dominated by black, kind of watery blues and greens, and white, with a little bit of red um, and some other colors as well. And we can compare this to uh, the Victorian Gothic. So this is kind of the later part of the, um, the 19th century. So you can see it's actually flipped. The Victorian Gothic is dominated by white and black, and then a little bit of those watery greens and reds as well. So this was actually surprising, again, that we could see this, um, this pretty clear difference between these two literary periods. We can also compare how different authors use color. So this slide is comparing Ad Radcliffe, who I talked about before, uh, Matthew Gregory Lewis, who wrote The Monk, an infamous uh, novel from the late uh, 18th century, and also uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. And so you can see, again, there's a really clear difference in the way authors are using color in their novels. Um, Radcliffe has a lot of black, but also a lot of natural colors. So again, those greens and blues. Um, Matthew Lewis uses a lot of whites and reds, which actually makes sense because his novels are a lot uh, kind of bloodier and sexier than Radcliffe's. Um, and Nathaniel Hawthorne is extremely dominated by black when compared to the others. However, this is because one of the stories in our corpus is all about a black veil. So again, it's really important to go back to the corpus when you're analyzing these results and you know, make sure that you're making a fair comparison. It's not really fair to compare this data if one of the stories is about a black veil. Of course, it's gonna have more references to black. Another thing we can do with this data is look for thematic patterns. Um, so this one I really liked. We looked at vampire tales through the century. So we started with Christabel from 1798 and ended with Dracula from 1897. 
And this actually really surprised me, because um, if you can see, the, the vampire tales from the Romantic period, so the ones in the top row, um, not only do they use fewer colors overall, but they don't actually use a lot of red. And the few instances of red that they do refer to are talking about flames or wine. They're not referring to blood. Um, by the time we get to the Victorian period, there's a lot more red, we can see, and they are starting to refer to blood. Um, so by the time we reach Dracula in 1897, that kind of modern vampire mythology has been established. So if I'm sure you recall, so Dracula, um, he drinks blood from his victim's neck. So that's a mythology that was established later in the century. And that's, I think, why we don't see all these references to blood um, earlier on. So let's go back to our original question. So this is the question that started it all. How similar is Radcliffe's palette um, to Udolfo's, the novel that she wrote? Sorry, how similar is Lorraine's palette, the painter, to um, The Mysteries of Udolfo? So here we're comparing the two side by side. There's the painting again by Lorraine, and there's the color palette from Radcliffe's novel. So at first glance, they actually don't seem similar at all, which is a little bit disappointing. Um, but if we look a bit closer, we'll see that actually Udolfo is dominated by green. There's a lot of green in Udolfo. Um, and so in that sense, it does actually seem quite similar to Lorraine's in that kind of tonal green quality, even though she uses a much broader palette, um, which again, was not something I was expecting to see. And we can go back to my second question as well. So if this is an iconic Gothic painting, how well does this reflect our findings about how color is used in Gothic literature? And actually this does, pretty accurately represent what we found. So there are a lot of blacks and dark reds um, and yellows, things like that, as well as a lot of white. And that's what we saw, um, as I showed you, in the Romantic and the Victorian periods. Um, one thing that this painting doesn't reflect, though, is that use of blues and greens, those natural colors that are absent from this painting but are very prominent in the literature. And those are the colors of nature, the ones that Radcliffe is using. Yeah, I'll say as a total non-literary literary scholar in any way, I can barely even say it, um, I think that uh, one thing that came out is really interesting for me it was just um, the amount of references to nature um, and n natural versus unnatural, supernatural versus natural. Like the, That whole contrast is very prevalent in the literature, but also obviously in the color. Um, another really interesting thing I thought um, Carolyn already knew this, but I thought it was really interesting, was that a lot of the words that they use are related to textile. Um, in the 20th century, a lot of the words we cut out of the, uh, of the Oxford English Dictionary list were uh, food words. So in, like the, in the uh, 20th century, people started using like avocado to mean green and stuff like that. Um, but in the uh, 19th century, a lot of the new color words were, were related to textile. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And obviously there's a lot of textile stuff going on in that one. So. That's my, that's my artistic critique of that. Um, <laughs> so, um, like I said earlier, we wanted to put this on the internet. Um, so it is on the internet. It's got a little bit of jank to it still, so you know, don't judge me. Um, but uh, it is up there, super easy to remember URL. Um, so it is, it is in fact up there, it's live if you wanna poke around, that's cool. Um, it's got, uh, you can search by author um, and you get you know, that beautiful radial, you get to see the, uh, like the color profile um, and the dictionary as well. We also have one link um, that shows you the entire palette, so the number of times in that 124 uh, text corpus uh, that we encountered each word. Um, and that's, that's ordered by alphabetically. So if, you know, if you're really a passionate Vermilion person, you can go mm -hmm. check it out. Um, so the other thing we did was we put this on GitHub because as Caroline mentioned, we, we hadn't encountered, she hadn't encountered, anybody uh, asking this question before. And so I really wanted to put it out there um, and see if anybody else was interested, if other people wanted to use the code or improve on the code. Um, so it is on GitHub, so if anybody is interested in that kind of stuff or if you've got a friend or relative who's, who's in, uh, in literary studies in any way, in the humanities more broadly, um, be happy to chat with them or if they wanna chat with us, we would love to. Um, if you find any issues, you can put them on GitHub too. Uh, and you can, of course, always chat with us on Twitter. I'm Eleanor Strib. This is Editrix Caroline. Editrix Caroline, yeah. Editrix Caroline. Um, and so that's, that's about it. We did, though, before we close, want to say thank you so much to PyCon for kind of taking a chance on this talk. It's not a very typical um, talk for PyCon, PyCon but um, hopefully you enjoyed it. And uh, also to PyLadies for general awesomeness and welcoming. And finally, to the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada that funds Caroline's research. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you very much. We've got about five minutes for questions, if anyone has questions for the ladies. Sure. Uh, I was wondering if you ever got the chance to actually do a pixel analysis of the of your images and actually do like a comparison at like uh, to image to the colors that you got from the novel and like actually do some mathematical, not just visual analysis of that. Yeah, we did that a little bit, and that's definitely something we could do more of. Um, yeah, so I can't remember what it's called. We found we found a kind of a website, a demo website that would do that for us. Um, but yeah, that's something we could definitely do in future and compare it to the okay the pixels. Yeah, yeah. I'd say one of the limitations of the way that we did it, like using the web colors, was mm -hmm. that I think there it, it gets doesn't get the nuance of stuff very well. Like yeah. so, you know, we we might uh, see the word blush or something like that, and where it's a very muted blush color in the painting. Like we don't really way of, of capturing that currently. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that's one of the reasons that it did look a little bit different. But there are very similar themes as Caroline said to of the green and the the blues and all that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you. That was absolutely absolutely fascinating. Um, did you find a way to deal with problems like? the names of colors that vary across time, like the word livid, which I saw was in one of your lists, mm -hmm, but has mm -hmm. changed, it seems to have covered several different colors over time, or even colors, names that have different meanings between cultures, maybe across the Atlantic, um, where the same name would represent actually a different color. Yes, that was definitely one of the problems we encountered. I know even blue and green, there's, I think it's Dickens who published um, a period called the, called the Blue Book, but to us it actually looks green. It's a color we would call green now. So that's one of the problems is the way that it changes across time. And we didn't actually find a solution to that um, because it's, it's, it's really hard to capture. You know, we don't, like, we don't know what Radcliffe meant by green. So we kind of are capturing the way we see it now. Um, but that's definitely something we, we struggled with, yeah. Thanks. So I was wondering if you used, um, if you ran your analysis on, um, I would say, uh, a controlled data set. So for example, not Gothic novels, but philosophical novels of the same period, uh, mm -hmm. or novels outside of the time period where, which you selected, and whether you've seen the difference. Do you want to take that one? Yes. That's, we were just talking about that, that we should try doing that and compare it to kind of non-Gothic. Also, I mean, Gothic is kind of a, it's a loose term, so we're defining it quite broadly. Um, but it would be really interesting to compare it, you know, to like novels and manners, like Jane Austen's novels, and see how they compare. Right, whether this yeah. color palette is specific to Gothic novels or just a yeah. time period. Yeah, it would be fascinating. Thank you so it, yeah. much for this talk. Oh, thank it's you. really nice. I was wondering, were there problems with the NLTK dealing with the differences in language from the 19th and 18th century versus today's modern language? Yeah, I actually, um, I tried Spacey as well. Um, I did a little test, and because uh, I, I heard it was really good and easy to use, and so I set that up. And I found it wasn't as good at catching the words um, as uh, NLTK was. And I don't know why that is. I'd really like to dig into that. Like if it's um, the way that uh, that it was it was created, like if it's trained on, on a broader uh, set of texts, perhaps, um, but it, it had trouble sometimes uh, classifying the different types of words. Um, not so much identifying the color words, but the classification, I think, was hard for it, and I think it's because of the different way that, that people use language then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the syntax could be quite different. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, you, you noted uh, you got a list of color words from the OED along with uh, dates of usage. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like some more detail about exactly how you got that list from the OED with dates of usage. Yes, it's yes. very non-technical. So, <laughs> so the OED, I use the online version, which has um, a historical thesaurus. And so it just provides you, it's kind of a taxonomy of color words. Um, by family and then the individual colors. And so we thought about trying to kind of scrape it somehow, but really I just typed it out. So I typed all those words into, you know, while watching TV, into oh, an did? Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, I, know I that. typed them all out. Yeah. You should have asked me. So I learned a lot of color words. That was actually a fascinating <laughs> process. There, I'm sure there was a better way to do it. So easily. Python. So oh <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the talk. I was just wondering if you, I've got two questions. Uh, firstly, if you'd looked at attribution of the colors to particular things, so mm -hmm. do landscapes get talked about differently to people, for example? Mm -hmm. And also, have you looked at all into uh, how the color palettes that you found, do they relate in any way to how literary historians now talk about those texts? 
uh, well. Um, I haven't actually encountered a lot of literary historians talking about color and text at all. That was something that was really surprising mm. um, when we started. So there, you know, there are a couple of articles here and there, but nothing that I came across that had really been done in, a, in this kind of a sustained way. Um, and what we had seen was kind of just your impressions of the novel. Like if you read Frankenstein, you say, oh, it's quite dark. Like there's a lot of black. Um, but this actually, not counteracted that, but it's, it's a more kind of precise way of looking at it. Um, yeah, so as a, I don't think there's much else out there about this. I see we've got two more people in line for questions. If we can do them quick, we'll get you both in. Sure. I was just wondering if uh, you handled it in any way um, or started to deal with like metaphorical use of color or use of this data to start studying the semiotics of, of the literature at a deeper level or a broader level. Yeah, that was something I would love to do. I'm not sure how to do that. Um, we did look at, I'll try to be quick. Uh, so we did look at colors that were attributive. So if they said, um, you know, that his peacock shirt or something like that, where they're using kind of peacock as a metaphor for that color blue. Um, but again, it's really hard to, to match the hex colors. That's the problem we had. And again, you know, snow, it can, snow looks different and we can't, it's really hard to pin down what exactly snow looks like. So it's definitely something I'd like to do more, but I don't know how, and maybe Eleanor will help Python. me. Python. Sure. <laughs> Python is the answer. Yeah. Hi, a few years ago there was a discovery uh, largely relating to Renaissance painters that the colors that, that we see were vastly changed from what mm -hmm. was originally mm -hmm. there. So like Titian uh, became much more colorful. Have you spoken to uh, an art restorer to see if the paintings that we see now when we look at paintings from from this period are in fact the colors that, that were what people saw when they looked at them in that period? Oh yeah, that's a great question. No, we haven't done that. Um, and I know, again, the slide is really dark. The painting is not actually as dark as it appears on the screen. Um, and you can Google it and see. It's, um, but but the, the style that um, the painting we're looking at is it's called a picturesque. So it's known for being very dark and tonal. So that's, that's what they were going for. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. That's a great question. We'll have to do that too. Thank you. So you could idea this. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And let's give them a big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Eleanor and Caroline, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for PyCon 2017.